Just like the previous videos analyzing the fleet doctrines of the Klingons and the Romulans, we'll now take a look at the Federation's strategic and tactical philosophy for Starfleet. Our favorite tactical genius villain, Grand Admiral Thrawn, would have a field day with this one, because the Federation is not one people or culture, but a diverse cacophony of species and civilizations that have somehow learned to unify. This makes it impossible to determine for certain any tactical patterns of Starfleet captains or admirals. This has great advantages and some weaknesses. The legendary Klingon General Chang assesses the Federation with frightening accuracy. I ask you now, what three things make the Federation a powerful adversary? General, it is their vast natural resources, their economic capacity, and the skills of their science. Good. Why? No. The answer lies in their political acumen. They have successfully knitted together countless worlds of diverse races, plundered their resources, assimilated their technologies, and absorbed their wealth. This is their strength, and it is also their greatest weakness. Their size is difficult to defend. Their resources are scattered by time and space. The political system is unwieldy. These Races were brought into Federation not naturally through conquest, but through diplomacy. This last is the key, for it renders the Federation a brittle unity, a unity we will shatter in the days of now. It is war's prize to take all advantages. With this in mind, the Federation always prefers diplomatic action over military ones, and is inherently pacifist. I believe Thrawn and Chang would agree with me that this has to do with the four founding races, the Andorians, Tellarites, Vulcans, and humans. Humans and Tellarites may act emotionally in a tactical situation if they're not disciplined, for example, whereas a Vulcan, although they may be slower to act, will analyze the situation and calmly devise an efficient plan. We know that the Vulcans and more recently humans endured wars that nearly destroyed their entire civilizations. This makes them very adverse to any notion of war. The Andorians, like Klingons and Romulans, have a warrior culture, but by the time of the formation of the Federation, they value cooperation far more than combat. It was ultimately the Romulan War that unified these four founding races of the Federation. The Federation has always maintained the position that they will never start a war. They at least say that most of their starships are not warships. That is, of course, until there is a war. It is true that most of the Federation cruiser designs are meant for a variety of non-combat related missions from exploration to humanitarian relief. However, they are well armed and can easily be made war ready when necessary. Smaller ships are more for policing against pirates and smugglers in peacetime not for fighting wars, and there is a difference between a police ship and a warship. However, they could also be easily converted into warships. While ships specifically designed for war were rare in Starfleet, the blueprints for these ships of war were always being devised. Non-warships are modularly designed, where the research labs or cargo areas can easily be refit to accommodate more weapons or upgraded combat systems. When attacked, the Federation almost always finds itself on the back foot, but over the centuries they've become fairly good at transitioning their fleet doctrine into an effective fighting composition. But because Starfleet is as much a scientific discovery force as it is a fighting force, they're very good at solving technical problems. For example, if a Romulan cloaking device has a flaw, trust me, eventually the Starfleet eggheads will find it. As explained in previous videos, phasers are very sophisticated and versatile weapons. They're a type of disruptor, but the nadion particles allow them to have so many fine-tuned settings that they can be tools as much as weapons, unlike the Klingon and Romulan disruptors, which were meant primarily for destruction. Phasers are arrayed on Federation ships to be able to cover all firing arcs. They are not focused forward like Klingon ships, except the Defiant, of course. Torpedoes are not as versatile and generally meant only for destruction, but they are often modified for special uses. Federation ships are not heavily armored. Their defenses consist of relatively strong shields 
and they can generally outrun their rivals. This is why when a Starfleet ship's shields go down, it isn't long before they incur heavy damage or are destroyed. Threats to the Federation over the centuries often determines the tactics involved. For example, in the 23rd century, the major threat was Klingons and Romulans. To counter cloaking devices, formations with overlapping sensors and weapons firing arcs were necessary. After the Borg attack on Earth, the Federation rushed to create several new ship designs meant to fight the Borg, such as the Akira class, Saber class, Sovereign class, and the infamous Defiant class. Luckily, by the time the Dominion invaded from the Gamma Quadrant, most of these designs were ready to deal with the formidable Dominion fleets. Ships not normally meant for combat, such as the Galaxy class, could be refit for war. Starfleet ships are very versatile. There is one ship class in particular that served for over a century, and that is the Miranda class. It has to do with the design's versatility. The roll bar at the top of the ship can be swapped out to accommodate a number of different modules, ranging from sensor suites to torpedo launchers. In the 24th century, the Nebula class followed the same design principle. By the 24th century, some cruisers such as the Galaxy class have the ability to extend their shields around other ships. This actually has great tactical applications that most Star Trek fans haven't thought of, but because I'm also an avid EVE Online player, I'll borrow some tactics from there and explain. A squadron of Starfleet ships with this remote shield projection ability can fly in tight formation. You see, most opponents choose a primary target and attempt to focus fire that target. This has been Tactics 101 throughout the ages. When this occurs, the other ships in the formation can transfer some of their shields to the ship that is taking the most damage and vastly improve their shields to keep them alive, and then switch this transfer when another ship is the focus of the enemy fire. Starfleet is also a think tank for innovative solutions. Where authoritarian cultures such as the Romulans and Klingons are very focused on the commanders and rarely do they value the input or the knowledge of their subordinates. Starfleet is just the opposite. All ideas are welcome, giving the captains and admirals many tactical options from which they can choose. Innovative thinking and cunning often win the day for Starfleet. Opponents of Starfleet have to win by destroying most of them before they have a chance to innovate and adapt. For if Starfleet is allowed to do so, they most certainly will begin to kick ass. Since day one. Thank you for watching, Space Friends. Be sure to check out the other videos about the fleet doctrines of other major powers. Be sure to give this video a like, share, subscribe, and I very much enjoy reading your comments as well. Until next time. Time slows down When I am singing my heart's true song Comes when I'm dreaming I know what it takes I need my soul to scream out I'm a dreamer, dreamer I need to choose